It's a good thing you're not a boy anymore. Because you have no cock. Asher Dirgi. He gets not his own Zaska. Don't be upset. Men never crave what they already have. It's only flesh. Misa means mother in Valerian. I know what Misa means. Undosa Jorge Kila at Likap series out Risote Munio Amazin on Jumbari. You're a greedy bitch, you know that? I lost my first boy. Little black haired beauty. He was a fighter too. Tried to beat the fever that took him. Forgive me. No, I knew this would happen. The witch told me years ago. She promised me three children. She promised me they'd die. He truly lived. He sailed around the world. Fought men from every country. Lay with the most beautiful women alive. And men. And men. Who killed them? I did. The other officers in this castle. We've committed treason, all of us. But I never once disobeyed an order. Loyalty is the foundation on which the Night's Watch is built. And the watch means everything to me. You haven't had to use that axe of yours in a long time. I hope you remember how. I remember how. Go. Ram. No, 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 Coming. Awesome, the pizza's here. Oh god, no! Ah! <laughs> and so we begin our episode with Bran, hooked into the Werewood net. By the way, who do you think is the barber down here? I mean, it has to be Mira, right? I mean, Jojen had a pretty good haircut. Right, but Bran's hair was horrible in season 4. I figure it has to be Leaf. I mean, she's hundreds if not thousands of years old. She must have picked up haircutting as a skill. And then we get this flashback of Ned kicking Benjen's ass. That's Roderick Cassell off to the right. He hasn't yet decided to tie his mutton chops underneath his chin yet. Ned tells Benjen to keep his shield up or he'll ring his head like a bell. If you remember, John tells the same thing to Ollie, which means Ned likely said the same thing to John. We get this quick scene with Liana, which made a lot of fans probably cream their pants. And then we find out that Hodor's real name is Willis. I feel like there's a different strokes joke here somewhere. Well, in the book, his name is Walder, but that's neither here nor there. But now we have this mystery of why can't Hodor talk? What you not talking about, Willis? Does, does that work? Anyway, the Three-Eyed Raven pulls Bran out and says it's beautiful beneath the sea, but if you stay too long, you'll drown. I wonder if that's a reference to Patchface. All of his sayings were about what happens under the sea. Or maybe the Three-Eyed Raven is a fan of Sebastian the Crab. So then Bran comes upstairs and talks to Mira. He tries to tell her about Willis, and she gives him this look. I have no idea how she could act so uninterested. She's been hanging out with Hodor for like three years. Anyway, Bran tells Mira that a war is coming, which doesn't exactly improve her mood. And then Leaf is suddenly there. How'd she get there? She was downstairs just a second ago. Is there another exit? Anyway, the budget department decided to spend a little more money on her makeup. But we find out that Bran is supposed to leave the tree. That's another big departure from the books. Meanwhile at the wall, Sir Alistair is saying, Little pig, little pig, let me in. And Sir Davos says, Not by the hair on my chinny chin chin. We still have no reason why Davos is all holed up in here, or why Alistair cares. Anyway, we're all really excited to see Davos fight wielding Longclaw, when suddenly... <music> Sorry, that, that was a really great show. But yes, Woon Woon busts in and says, what's that noise? The wildlings easily take the castle, and amazingly, there's only two deaths. And Tormund finds out, yup, 
John is still dead. So there hasn't been any dick talk yet in the episode, so we get this weird scene with a peasant bragging about how he whipped out his penis in front of Cersei and she licked her lips. Now there apparently is some truth to his story. His prosthetic penis is enormous. But understandably so, Cersei never even opens her mouth during her walk of shame. Regardless, Sir Robert Strong doesn't like people talking smack about his queen. Next we get this weird scene where Cersei is examining Thread. I'm not sure what she's up to. Maybe she's going to strangle somebody later? Anyway, we find out that she's barred from attending her own daughter's funeral. Which apparently Tommen feels a little bad about. What's a bit odd about this scene is that Tommen mentions that Prince Tristane's killers are still on the loose, but he suspects his mother. Did Lady Nim not use her whip at all when she got on that boat? How'd they deal with Tristane's guards? A whip mark on anyone would be a dead giveaway that it was her. Maybe all the guards were in on it too, just like in Dorne. It's just a bit odd. No one saw another ship come into the bay? Next, Jamie and the High Sparrow have a little pissing contest. Jamie begins to list off his sins, and interestingly, in a bit of continuity, he lists his cousin that he killed off in season two. Anyway, he thinks about killing off the High Sparrow, but then wimps out. In our next scene, Cersei is contemplating her necklace, and this makes me think back to her thread. Is she thinking about strangling somebody? Anyway, Tommen apologizes, and Cersei seems to accept the apology. So I sure hope she isn't thinking about killing him, because kinslaying seems to be all the rage these days. Meanwhile over in Marine, Tyrion makes a joke about Varys not having a dick, and realizes that he insulted Grey Worm at the same time. I kind of feel like Theon should be on this small council. So Varys tells us that Yunkai and Astapor have returned to slaving. Let's not forget that Varys' best friend Illyrio is a slaver. Missandei then tells us that the dragons aren't eating, so Tyrion gets the bright idea to go down to the dragon pit. Tyrion believes that chaining the dragons inside is causing them not to eat and stunting their growth. This is in fact incorrect. The dragons are much bigger since Daenerys first put them in the pit. And I do wonder who re-collared these dragons. These new collars are enormous, and clearly not the same collars that Daenerys put on originally. Tyrion tells a little story about how he was little, and he asked his uncle Garion for a dragon. Garion is essentially Tyrion's Benjen. He went missing, and now everyone's expecting him to show up. Maybe he's a character called the Shrouded Lord. Maybe he's a character called the Corsair King. Maybe he's both. So Brandon, the dragons seem to like Tyrion. Do you think this means he's a secret Targaryen? Ugh, I hope not, but I will say there is some evidence for it. Tyrion does have one black eye, which may actually just be a dark purple eye. Regardless, having two different colored eyes may mean he's a chimera. Parts of his body are genetically different from other parts of his body. He may have double super special lineage. So once again, the waif comes to beat up Arya, and again, no one in the background cares at all. The waif is even wearing the garb from the House of Black and White. They are the worst secret society. Jockin even shows up in broad daylight. I guess they're not using that face again for any missions. So in our next scene, we find out that the six men that were chasing Sansa and Theon are all dead. So that sixth one didn't run away with the dogs. But we still don't know how he died. I guess he just had a heart attack looking at awesome Brienne. So Ramsay is worried about the existence of Jon Snow and his claim on Winterfell. So he wants to attack Castle Black. Now Roose thinks this is madness because it'll unite all of the northern houses against him. Kind of the crow calling the raven black, don't you think? What do you mean? Well, I mean, Roos participated in the Red Wedding, killing a member of almost every northern house. That action was much more likely to unite the north against him. As for attacking Castle Black, considering Jon Snow just led a bunch of wildlings through the wall, one would think that wouldn't be so bad. Regardless, the tense scene is interrupted by happy news. A newborn baby! Let's, Let's celebrate! celebrate. But then Ramsay stabs Roos. Last episode, we had three major characters get killed. This is one, and oh no, Walda, and that is a very healthy Craig Hall Frey baby. He's almost the same size as Gilly's four-year-old. Walda offers going back to the Riverlands, but Ramsay sicks his dogs on her. Bro, bro, it's really bright in here. Where am I? You have, you have entered, entered the, the dog, dog net. net. I am the Three-Eyed Bro. I will be your guide, Chad. A war is coming. Others are here as well. Cool, I'm a really good fighter. You will never fight again, but you will nitpick. Oh, we're back with Brienne and she's talking about what happened to Arya. And she lies and fails to mention that Arya was with the Hound. Hey, wait a minute. Missing Hound? Missing Hounds? That's friggin' genius. No, it's just sloppy writing. 
So anyway, Theon tells Sansa that he's not heading to the Wall. At first he tries to claim that it's a safety thing, but then he admits that he's too ashamed to face Jon. I have to say, Theon going off alone is probably the most dangerous thing he ever did. He's the most hated man in the North. I don't know how he's gonna get home. He's gonna need to find a ship somehow. What Northerner would possibly help him? Ugh, oh, finally, after a season and a half, we finally get back to the Ironborn. We find out that the Ironborn's last hold in the North, Deepwood Mott, has fallen. And Yara is beginning to question her father's judgment. Theon comes up and Yara says she's not ashamed of trying to save him. Of course, if I were her, I'd be ashamed. She just left Theon there and told everyone that he died. And then we get this awesome scene where Balon meets his brother Euron on the rope bridge. Now in the book, there are a lot of theories on who murdered Balon. Was it Euron? Was it a faceless man? Was it a maester? Was it Jason Malister? Here in the show, Balon wasn't even murdered. Euron kills him in self-defense. And so next we're at Balon's funeral and Yara thinks she's queen of the Iron Isles. But a drowned priest nonchalantly says there's going to be a king's moot. That is quite a surprise. There hasn't been a king's moot in like 5,000 years. Even if we accept different continuity, there at least hasn't been a king's moot in 300 years. It also seems 100% certain that Balon's body is going to wash up back on shore. And then back at the wall, we have this scene that just doesn't make any sense at all. Davos comes in and asks Melisandre to resurrect Jon Snow. Why? Why on earth would Davos want Jon Snow resurrected? What is his dog in this fight? Davos essentially had two motives, to make Stannis king and to help the Wall in their fight against the White Walkers. Davos barely knew Jon, and what he does know about Jon is that he was a pretty divisive leader. He got himself assassinated. Why would Davos, a man who blames Melisandre for the death of his son, go to her and ask her to resurrect Jon? The whole reason they went to the Wall was because dead people were rising and marching against it. The entire Davos character is someone that doesn't like black magic. But now randomly, for no good reason, he wants Melisandre to dabble in it and resurrect Jon. Davos speaks with all of this urgency in the scene, but there's no urgency. Anyone can be Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. And so Melisandre begins to wash Jon in the Season 5 Arya school of slowly washing a body. After all, those Arya scenes were some of the fans' favorites. So after washing Jon for a full minute, she then proceeds to give him a haircut for a full minute. And then Melisandre proceeds to say gibberish for two full minutes. And then everyone stands around and stares at each other for a full minute and a half. And then Jon does what we all knew he was going to do because it was on the poster. Wow, sweet Robin, you really ended this episode on a negative note. Holy crap, you're alive! That's all for now. Leave your questions below and see you in a few days for the serious Q&A. Thanks for watching.